There's not a lot of NMIs who are doing uh, absolute calibration. In fact, we have NIST and we have NRC mainly in the world because BTB has stopped many years ago to um, to provide this service. So we are really happy to have you, Luke. Yeah, thank you, Gail, and and thank you for organizing this very nice virtual seminar and for everyone attending. I've I've enjoyed the talks so far, and I'm I'm looking forward to the the two that follow follow mine as well. Um, my presentation will be a description of our reference gloss meter, which is an instrument that's been uh, in use at NRC since um, I think since 1970. And this is what we use to uh, carry out calibrations of specular gloss. Uh, can I just confirm that everyone can see my slides? OK, yeah. before I go on. Yeah, okay. yeah. great, great. OK, so uh, my outline is shown here. I'll start by giving a, a brief overview of of the measurement of specular gloss. There'll be a fair amount of of overlap with what Gail and Clarence have have already said, but um, we'll, we can go over that again so that it's fresh for when we move on to to the instrument. Uh, the actual instrument itself, I'll tell you a bit about its optical layout. I'll I'll briefly describe the quartz wedge standards that that we use. Um, we, that's already. You know, basically been well, well, it has been very well explained in the previous talk. I'll tell you a bit about how we aim to control the various spectral and geometric conditions that can impact uh, a gloss measurement. I'll tell you a bit about, you know, what our measurement procedures look like for a standard calibration. And then I'll go over a few of the intercomparisons that have been done over the years in order to validate the performance of this, uh, this instrument. Uh, and then finally, I'll finish with um, a description of another instrument we have very briefly, a uh, reference gonio spectrophotometer. Uh, this instrument is also capable of, of measuring specular gloss. Okay, so the, the basics of specular gloss, we, uh, for, for the purpose of my talk, uh, can sort of set aside the various uh, psychophysical aspects of it that, that Gail outlined. And we can think of this as just a standardized measurement of the amount of light reflected within a specified solid angle about the specular direction. Um, so you can you've seen this this kind of cartoon already several times, but in in the basic experiment we have a test sample. It's illuminated at some angle of incidence theta, and there's a receiver that uh, that collects the reflected light, uh, also viewing along the, uh, the the specular direction. Now, in, in general, this, this, uh, this measurement will depend on the optical constants of the material. It'll depend on their dispersion with wavelength, and, uh, and it's also going to depend on their light distribution properties. So in order to obtain a meaningful measurement that can be compared between instruments, it's, it's important that uh, the experimental uh, conditions related to geometry, by that I mean the angle of incidence and the field angles, the spectral conditions and the polarization of, of the measurement device are all uh, well controlled. And that's exactly what standards like ISO 2813 uh, prescribe. So the, here I've, I'm showing a table of the various uh, spectral and geometric uh, conditions that are expected for that standard. And of course, as we've heard, um, the standard is, is defined such that um, this uh, theoretical or fictitious black glass of Refractive index 1.567 uh, defines uh, 100 units, uh, 100 gloss units at, at each angle of incidence. So um, this is a schematic of our uh, of our instrument. Uh, as I mentioned, the, it was constructed in uh, in 1970 by Wolfgang Budda. Uh, I, I pronounce it Budda. It's a little, but I'm not sure if that's correct either. Um, so it was designed by Butta in in uh, in the 70s, and it's been in use since then in in our lab. It consists of uh, of a source arm, so it's shown here on the left, um, uh, and that source source arm's subcomponents include a strip filament lamp, a pair of filters designed to shape the spectral distribution of that uh, of that lamp into something resembling CIE illuminant C. There's a pair of condenser lenses that image that filament onto a source aperture. The radiation that passes through that source aperture is collimated by, by this first lens here. It reflects off the sample, 
and it's collected by a second lens of equal focal length uh, that then focuses that light down onto the receiver aperture. At that point, the light passes to, uh, to a photometer um, that consists of a diffusing cavity, a V-lambda filter, and, uh, and a photomultiplier tube. Uh, a few other notes about, about our instrument. This is uh, this instrument's designed to con conform to ISO 2813 and ASTM D523, as well as ISO 7668, which, uh, which includes this additional 45 degree uh, angle of incidence. It's a collimated beam instrument, and, um, and as our standard, we use these NRC uh, quartz wedges that, uh, that Clarence described. And so in a standard measurement, we would make a recording with our test sample, and then we would swap in our, our quartz wedge in order to, to obtain an absolute gloss reading. Uh, so to make this more concrete, here's a photograph of the instrument as it, as it exists today. So on the left, you have the, uh, the source arm with its various components. The sample is mounted uh, against a, a mounting plate at the center here. It's held in place by a spring-loaded plunger. Um, and then the receiver arm is, um, is, is on the right here. Uh, these two arms are able to, to travel uh, about, or to, to uh, rotate about the sample position. So they actually wheel along on this, uh, this table and, uh, and their motion is controlled by a pair of, of motorized rotary stages. Um, I should say there's also, uh, you know, baffling that's normally installed that's, that's been removed for, for the purpose of taking the, uh, the photograph. So, uh, so our quartz wedge standards. So I, I'm just going to really briefly describe these. We've already, you know, heard about how this is is done, but the basic idea is you have a nice optical material whose refractive index you know, and you can use the Fresnel relations to compute the uh, the specular gloss at different angles. Uh, we use a wedge geometry to remove this first surface reflection, and as an optical material, we're using uh, SuperSil 311 glass. Um, and this has a number of nice properties as a, as a reference material. Um, the uh, variations in the refractive index are at, thought to be at the PPM level, has very few inclusions or other defects in the bulk of the glass that might lead to some unwanted scattering. And, uh, and our experience has also been that it's highly stable and, and non-fluorescent, making it a, a nice material to use for this purpose. OK, so at this point, I'm just going to return to uh, how we control these these various experimental conditions in, in our instrument, and I'll, I'll go through each of those. Uh, so the first thing is the angle of incidence. So we we set the angle of incidence using a set of uh, of isosceles glass prisms, and we do that using this this arrangement that depicted on the right here. So we place a robust first surface reflector at the sample position. And the uh, the prism, um, so a prism with a say a twenty degree base angle, is placed flush to the surface of that reflector. Um, and what that does is it produces a retro reflected image of the source aperture that falls back on the source aperture it's, itself. And so by uh, you know uh, viewing that retro reflected image, we can carefully uh, align our source arm. When the uh, when the retro reflected image overlaps with with the aperture, we know that that we have the correct angle of incidence. Uh, once that's done, the prism is removed, and we do a similar procedure with the receiver arm, uh, but instead making use of the uh, the specular reflectance from our our first surface reflector. Uh, the field angles it's it's very straightforward as well. Um, and I think Gail basically, I think, described how this works already. But um, but the field angles are are determined by the size of these source and receiver apertures, and by the focal lengths of these two mirrors, or excuse me, these two lenses, uh, which in our case is is 193 millimeters. And so it's very straightforward to just convert the angles, showing the uh, the in plane angles here from. Um, uh, ISO 2813. It's very straightforward just to convert those those angles into a length, uh, and you do the same thing with the tolerances, and that will tell you for a given focal length how big your apertures should be. Um, and we believe these apertures, or these the dimensions of our apertures, are accurate within 0.1 millimeters, which ends up being plenty to to satisfy the uh, the tolerances specified in the standard. Uh, okay, so the spectral conditions. So in this 
uh, what I mean by that is that, you know, we try to uh, match our source spectral power distribution to CIE illuminant uh, C, and we try to match the spectral responsivity of our photometer to uh, the V lambda function. So we do that using several custom uh, optical filters. So in the uh, in the source uh, uh, source arm, we have a pair of filters, a glass filter, which actually acts to convert our uh, the emission from our, our lamp into something resembling source A. And then we have uh, an additional uh, Davis Gibson liquid filter that's used to convert that into source C. Um, this is a kind of um, classical uh, optical device, the Davis Gibson filter. It's actually a liquid filter, so it consists of a pair of cuvettes and you fill each cuvette with a suitable solution. And um, if you're you know, you do this correctly, you'll you'll get the the, the correct uh, transmittance spectrum that you're after. Um, and um, and it's a, again a similar idea with the photometer. We use a, a custom glass filter to ensure that the response of of this uh, of the photometer is is what we want. Um, and in both cases, the way this is done is we we determine uh, we directly determine the spectral characteristics of the bare lamp. Uh, or the uh, spectral responsivity of the bare photo receiver, and then we optimize these filters by, for example, varying the thickness of the glass or the, the choice of glass in these filters in order to uh, to achieve our target. Uh, and that's what's shown in this this uh, this plot here. So in blue is the responsivity of the bare photomultiplier tube. Uh, in orange is the spectral responsivity of the filter plus the PMT. Uh, and that can be seen to agree very well with the uh, the target V lambda function, which is shown in, in green here. There's some deviations in the blue. Uh, we don't regard those as, as very important. So uh, polarization, um, as we've heard, uh, the gloss is largely reflects, uh, you know, the, the properties of the Fresnel relations. Um, and so when you're talking about uh, the specular reflectance at finite angle of incidence uh, polarization can can be important uh, and so what we try to do is to to minimize the um, the polarization bias in our instrument so in the source uh, arm we use uh, what i think is a, a fairly clever trick due to 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 due to butta so he noticed that the emission from these strip filament lamps because this is a a, a strip uh, it's it's highly unpolarized, uh, provided you're looking at the center of the strip, and that's just because you're viewing a planar emitter uh, along the normal, and there's no reason um, that it would favor either S or, or P polarization. And so the way this uh, this arm is is constructed is that we actually uh, the image of the strip filament slightly overfills the source aperture, uh, and as a result, we only make use of radiation from the the center of the of the filament. Uh, and this this turns out to produce a fairly low degree of polarization at the the sample position. Um, we consider it to be better than than one percent. On the uh, on the photometer side, we use a diffusing cavity that's mounted in front of the uh, in front of the photometer. So this consists of a pair of uh, I think it's ground opal glass uh, diffusers at each end end of a cyl cylindrical cavity. And then the cavity itself is uh, cylindrical and it's coated with a, a good white uh, diffuser. And so as a result, um, you know, uh, radiation entering that cavity scatters uh, and becomes completely depolarized. And as a result, the uh, uh, polarization sensitivity of the photometer is also um, uh, eliminated. So a typical measurement protocol after a warm-up period, we would set the uh, instrument for the desi desired geometry. So uh, that involves set selecting the right receiver aperture and then running through uh, this prism uh, alignment procedure that I described to set the angle of incidence. We take a zero reading with a shutter closed. So we have a shutter in our receiver arm. Um, and then we take um, three readings, uh, two with the uh, gloss standard in the beam and and those sandwich uh, reading of the actual test sample. We average those two uh, uh, readings of the gloss standard to, to reduce any uh, any drift. And then we compute uh, the, the gloss of the actual test sample according to this equation, making use of the known gloss of our uh, standard. 
And that's repeated several times in order to uh, determine a, a sample mean and, and standard deviation. Uh, of course, it's important to confirm that our instrument is uh, functioning correctly before we we uh, we calibrate a client sample. So we we keep on hand a number of validation standards whose whose gloss we've tracked over a number of years. And so to convince ourselves that the instrument is operating correctly before uh, we would we would measure one of these these um, these samples before calibrating a client sample and just confirm that what we're we're, we're seeing is consistent with the, the historical spread. So I'd, I'd be a negligent metrologist if I didn't put a uncertainty budget in somewhere. Uh, so this is a typical uncertainty budget for black glass. Um, I think the uncertainty analysis for gloss is a bit tricky because it's highly sample dependent um, and you tend to get the best performance when you have uh, when you're measuring sort of like to like. So when your your test sample is very similar to your uh, reference. And so in this case, these are values that we think are representative for for a black glass gloss standard, which is not exactly like our quartz, but but not not that different in the grand scheme of things. Uh, so we we have uh, sources of uncertainty related to the angular setting, the aperture size, nonlinearity, polarization, spectral conditions, and also uh, uncertainty in the gloss of our, our standards. Uh, those are all type B uncertainty components, and they're combined with the uh, the reprodu reproducibility term that's estimated from repeat measurements. And when we put those all together, we end up with uh, a K equals two expanded uncertainty of about 0.3 gloss units. Uh, I didn't I didn't say any say much about the nonlinearity, but that's um, the way we deal with that is is we we have a facility um, for for measuring uh, the linearity of a photo detector, and so we basically have done that with this uh, with the photomultiplier tube used in the instrument, and then we ensure that we we stay in in uh, a linear regime of, of photo currents where where the the non residual nonlinearity is is thought to be quite small. Now, uh, over the years, there have been a number of uh, efforts in order to, to validate the performance of this instrument. Um, one that I'll talk about a bit was done in 2003. This was a bilateral intercomparison done with, with NIST. And in this comparison, the two labs exchanged six samples and they were measured in both labs and the results compared. Uh, these are some, um, these are some of those, uh, well, some of the results from that, that uh, intercomparison. Uh, which what's being shown in these plots is the relative difference in the scales uh, at 20 and 60 degrees for uh, the six different standards used in the study. And you can see that for the most part that the um, the two instruments or the two labs are in agreement uh, within the stated uncertainties. And it's a similar story. Uh, we did um, uh, another color, uh, another comparison around the same time involving NPL and, and BAM. Uh, so you do, when you look at this data, you do occasionally see some outlier samples. So there's one in the 20 degrees and one in the 60 degrees. The 60 degree sample, for example, is, is a haze gloss um, standard. So we believe it has a slightly more complicated BRDF than just a, a nice smooth optical surface. And that that kind of, well, that that's probably what complicates getting a, a reliable measurement with that, that sample. So at this point, I'll move on to describing our reference gonio spectrophotometer. So this is another instrument that that we have at NRC. It's um, it's uh, more recent. It was constructed in 2005, and it can it can measure specular gloss in the geometries, the same geometries as the reference gloss meter, but it can also uh, satisfy the, the geometries prescribed in other standards. So it can do, for example, 75 degrees angle of incidence. And it's also capable of realizing a, a focused beam geometry, which is called for um, in, in certain standards. I think this TAPI standard, for example, requires that. Um, it does have some differences versus the, the instrument I've just described to you. Uh, being more modern, it has uh, much better automation. So in this sample, or excuse me, in this instrument, the sample and the reference are mounted on this turntable, which means we can interchange between the sample and reference automatically. 
uh, and the device is also capable of set automatically selecting the angle of incidence. So it's a big quality of life upgrade. The sample can be installed and aligned, and then we can run through gloss in, in many geometries in one swoop. Another technical detail that I'll just uh, mention, it's a bit informative, is that in this case, to control the polarization of the source, rather than um, rather than making use of this trick of buttas, we use an integrating sphere here, and that's also very effective in depolarizing uh, the light reaching the sample. Now, at the time this instrument constructed, it's it was constructed. Its performance was was assessed relative to our, our reference um, reference gloss meter. That's what's shown on the left here in these three plots. These are uh, gloss differences. Uh, so the well, the 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 gloss difference between the two instruments for a number of different standards. The nominal haze value, or excuse me, nominal gloss values of the standards are marked in parentheses, and that's for shown for 20, 60, and, and 85 degrees. And you can see happily the you know these these agree quite well within the uncertainties. This is very nice to have around as a sanity check. If we ever uh, start to doubt ourselves on the other instruments or we make some change, it's very handy to have these around this this other instrument around in order to validate what what we're doing. Uh, and we actually did that very recently. Uh, we made some changes to the sample mount on this uh, this gonio spectro or gonio photometer instrument. Um, and so by checking, well, so we can run through a, a quick check uh, comparing the performance of the two instruments. Um, that's what's shown in these plots on the right for a, for a vitrolite check standard and for a, a high gloss check standard. And you can see that, um, you know, we, we retain good agreement between the, the two instruments. Uh, I will take the opportunity to promote our gloss services briefly. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, the services we have available, you can find them at uh, at this URL. Uh, we provide gloss measurements in a number of, of geometries, and these quartz wedge gloss standards are also available as a custom service. So if you have any questions about these, these points or more broadly about my presentation, you can uh, I invite you to get in touch with me at this email address. I'd be happy to discuss these these things more with you. Uh, and so then I'll just finish with some acknowledgments. The various uh, staff at NRC over the years that have contributed to our gloss gloss uh, measurement capabilities, uh, especially Eric Cote and Stacy Lee, who are my my current colleagues here. And um, most of my talk is contained in these these various papers that have been put out. By our group over the years, so if you're looking for for more details, um, you can you can take a look there. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention.